Now, if you or somebody that you know has served a mission, chances are pretty good that they're, they will be very familiar with DNC Section 4. Uh, back when I served my mission, every single district meeting, every zone conference, every meeting at the MTC always began with everybody standing up and reciting Doctrine and Covenants Section 4 in its entirety, all seven verses, from start to finish. There's an interesting thing to consider here. We use it, and, and rightly so, we use it as a, as a missionary scripture because of what it's talking about here, but look very carefully at the, the intro and the origin of this section. Look at the date in the heading. Who's receiving it? Uh, you'll notice the church isn't even established yet and won't be for, for more than a year at this point uh, in early 1829. Like Tyler, I came to love the scripture as a missionary and remember struggling as a young missionary to memorize all of this. And it's only been recently listening to uh, church history scholars like Steve Harper who are really focused on some of the details surrounding this section. It's significant that this is given individually to Joseph Smith Sr. Yes, we can liken this to ourselves. We can liken this to the work that we all should be engaged in where the field is right, white, ready to harvest. This is given to one man, Joseph Smith Sr., a farmer, sometimes, depending on how the weather was going. What I love about this is when Jesus was on the earth, he called four simple fishermen in the Galilee, and he asked them to become fishers of men. And here in our modern-day restoration, he goes to poor, simple farmers. And to this one particular farmer, he tells him to be a farmer of men. I love how the God of the universe knows each of us individually and will contextualize his message to suit our circumstances. So whether you're a farmer or have any other skill set, God invites you to the work. And I suppose he could use any kind of metaphor to take your skills and your talents and your dreams and passions in the service of God's work. So you'll notice in section 4 verse 1, it says, Now behold, a marvelous work is about to come forth among the children of men. Just as a, as a little note here, the word marvelous, we, we often use it to mean, oh, wonderful. The reality is, is the root of marvelous is marvel, which means it, it's, it defies logical explanation. We marvel at it. How, how did that happen? And so the very first thing given to Joseph Sr. is this promise that there's going to be a work come forth that is a marvel, that can't be always explained <clears throat> by the, the wisdom of, of human logic and, and reason. And just for some background with Joseph Sr., he He's a descendant of Congregationalists, but he has chosen to stay more aloof of, of the religious parties of the day, very similar, in fact, to Joseph Jr., and he hasn't joined any of the churches. He has had multiple dreams, troubling dreams, unsettling dreams for many years leading up to this, and in all of his dreams, it involves him working through, through dark and dreary kinds of wildernesses, and right as he gets to the end or an angel in a dream will invite him into a garden or there seems to be some resolution coming, then the dream ends. And, and it's left him feeling like there's something good coming in the midst of all of these struggles, and this is a guy who is not a very successful farmer. He, he has lost a lot of crops either to weather or to a con man on one occasion with, with some ginseng root being shipped and then he being lied to and losing money on that. He has lost lots and lots of, of opportunities to earn money as a farmer, and he's relocated his family. He, his, the, the frame home that he builds on the property, he, he loses that, a foreclosure on his mortgage. His life has been hard, 
as he's trying to eke a living out of this frontier. And now, can you imagine how it must have felt to him to hear the words? A marvelous work is about to come forth among the children of men. As Joseph, his son, is receiving this revelation for him and for Joseph Sr. to realize this work that's so marvelous is going to be brought forth into the world through my son, it had to be kind of a remarkable moment for him. Verse 2, Therefore, O ye that embark in the service of God, see that ye serve him with all your heart, might, mind, and strength. You'll notice, brothers and sisters, that in the work of the Lord that he doesn't just want part of you, he wants all of you. He wants all aspects of our life to be devoted and dedicated to him. The two, the two instruments of revelation are included here that we're going to be talking about shortly in, in a subsequent lesson, that our whole heart and our whole mind, our might and our strength, all of it is devoted to the Lord and given to him. Notice verse 3, if ye have desires to serve God, ye are called to the work. Did you notice that? Desires, he didn't say if you have abilities, if you have degrees, if you have a certain pedigree, if you're a descendant of certain people, he didn't say any of that. He said if you have desires, then you're called to the work. That's what, that's what is going to get you the call. Then verse uh, 4, for behold, the field is wide already to harvest, and lo, he that thrusteth in his sickle with his might, the same layeth up in store that he perisheth not, but bringeth salvation to his soul. As Taylor was saying earlier, what a beautiful verse to communicate very clearly with a farmer about what God intends him to do in this metaphorical sense of thrust in your sickle to harvest this field that God, that the Son, has ripened over time. Then notice verse 5, and faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God qualify him for the work. Did you notice? Desires to serve God, you're called. Well, what qualifies you? That's what calls you, but what qualifies you? There's this, this long list in verse 5 of things that qualify you to be able to be a sharp instrument in the hands of the Lord in harvesting the souls of men in, in participating in this gathering effort. Faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God. President Russell M. Nielsen many years ago when he was uh, an apostle at the time in the Quorum of the Twelve gave a great talk about what it means to have your eye single to the glory of God, and he used it as the example or the analogy of binoculars, that out of one eye you see one thing and out of another eye you see something else, but to make your eye single means that you bring those two images together and now what God and what God intends for me and what I want for me now become the same thing and it becomes three-dimensional not a two-dimensional um, image. Beautiful. As I swallow up my will in God's will, then I can see things more clearly the way he wants me to see them, and my eye becomes single to his glory. I'm not doing it for me. I'm now doing it for him. And then he says in verse 6, remember. So, so we've been called, we've now been qualified, for the work through these things, and now the things to remember as we embark in this work. Remember faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance. By the way, the word temperance in, in an 1829 context has to do with abstaining from alcohol. Joseph Sr., um, he, he ad acknowledged and admitted the fact that he had given himself to too much use of alcohol up to this time, and so it's interesting that for him, temperance is a big deal, and coming from God through his son, he's reminded of that. So faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, charity, humility, diligence. 
and he's told that if he'll ask, he'll receive, and if he knocks, it will be opened unto him. What a beautiful message to the prophet's father who is struggling to figure out what God would have him do in order to help build up the kingdom in the latter days.